All right, so let's start this. All right, just going to share my screen. All right, so uh, everybody see this okay? Yep. All right, so um, yeah, I thought I would just share with you some of the adventures I've taken in learning about, you know, how to fight like <laughs> And I, and I certainly don't have the brain power of, of Mark, uh, Mark C or Corey, um, but you know, I've, I've been able to do a little research, but most of what I've learned is through trial and error. But um, anyway, so, you know, just like most of you, you know, being in, in where, where we are in, in uh, the Chicago area, like in my part of Batavia, it's a uh, Bortle uh, seven, you know, but you know, Peck Farm Park, which isn't far from me, um, is Bortle uh, five, five, six. So, you know, just driving like two miles, two, three miles makes a big difference. Um, I have a street light out front, um, which is uh, sodium vapor. Um, so I shoot exclusively out of my side yard um, and, and with filters um, to get the results I do. So, um, Let's go ahead and get going in here. So uh, fighting light pollution with filters, as I mentioned, I'm an empirical dummy. I've learned a lot of things, what not to do um, by trial and error. Um, and a lot of it, I, I, most of what I learned really is with the, when I was using the DSLR. Um, most of the filters uh, that were really hard to work with um, so even though, you know, most of what I'm going to talk about tonight is, is geared towards astrophotography, you can apply some of it towards uh, visual. And I would encourage you to interrupt, ask questions, especially around visual stuff. Um, because, you know, I, I haven't had recent experience with it, but I have had some. And, you know, I know there's a lot of people here who could speak up and talk about some of the visual uh, filters you could use. So uh, what kind of signal do we want to capture? And the, the analogy that, uh, you know, it resonates with me is kind of, um, you know, we want to, we want to get like on a radio station, we want to get 106, but we also want to get 104 and 102 who happens to be playing the same song at the same time, but they have different instruments, right? And so that's kind of like what we try to do with with our filters. We try to allow the certain signals to get through um, and not hear anything between 104 and 106 and and so forth. So, um, and we don't want to catch any static from any of the radio stations. We'd like to filter that out. Um, so, you know, and what's interesting uh, for us, you know, when, when we look at the visible spectrum, it's just a small sliver of the entire spectrum, right? So X-ray, ultraviolet, um, infrared, and so on. Um, but what we're looking at is really the, the 400 to 750 nanometer spectrum. And all the light that we, we deal with, both good and bad, falls into that spectrum. So what kind of types of signals do we want to capture? Um, and, to, and this list is to various degrees, right? So hydrogen beta, eh. Um, we definitely want to catch hydrogen alpha because that's where all the nebula uh, stuff is. O3, the same thing. Sulfur as well. And of course, we want to capture red, green, and blue. So th those are the things we really want to get. What we don't want to get is those guys, right? So we get air glow, whether that's uh, light pollution bouncing, bouncing off the atmosphere, whether it's moon glow, uh, mercury spectrum, sodium spectrum. So we have mercury vapor lights, sodium vapor, and also LED too, which I didn't put on here, but I should have. So all those things is how do we collect what's on the top um, and filter out what's on the bottom? So that's, that's the challenge we all have. So how do we capture um, with the OSC camera, which is one shot color? Um, we have DSLRs, we have modded DSLRs, which uh, you know a lot of our members have. 
um, a little of each dedicated astro camera. Some, you know, <laughs> few of us have those. Um, and, you know, essentially, you know, it's with these type of cameras, one shot color, it's generally RGGB, although there are variations of that. So, you know, it's a red, two greens and a blue. Um, with mono, there is no RGGB. Um, and the filters that you need to use uh, are luminance, red, green, blue, and then various narrow bands. Um, the advantage of one shot color, of course, is it's one shot, <laughs> right? So for those of us who, who aren't retired and don't have a lot of time to, to go through stuff, I, you know, that's why I'm still doing one shot color. Um, but if you have, you know, have the time and have the, the patience to accumulate a lot of time on all these different filters, you're going to get a little better of a product and product when you're done. But you, you've got to shoot through each of those filters. May, may I ask a question? Yeah. Um, how, how markedly better is the product of the mono shots versus one shot color? Uh, maybe and Mark, Mark, do you want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, um, there, it's, it's a trade off between the quality and how many hours you want to spend. Um, typically, you'll spend four times longer with mono than you will with one shot color. And the signal to noise ratio, which is what, and the resolution, is typically about two times better, maybe three. So it is better, but if you, the real thing, of course, here is the weather. It's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to set my camera up and let right. it run automated and I'll go to bed and get up in the morning and all the data will be captured. Well, that's all very fine if you live in, you know, north of Mojave, California, when there's no, when there's no fires. Uh, but if you live around here, you typically can't shoot as long because of the weather. I mean, if you get three clear nights in a row, we all rejoice and go right. out to the bar. Um, yeah. So that's the real limitation. I mean, ideally, you would want to shoot mono. The problem is it's tougher to do because you, got, you need more clear sky time to accumulate the data. Right. Well, so, the other thing about mono is that your entire CCD chip or CMOS chip, whatever you're using these days, will be capturing all red, all green, or all blue, where with one shot color, you're dividing the pixels up into right. the red, green, green, blue. Yep, yep. and that's so why that's the resolution. Mark was talking about with the resolution. Yep. So yes, you, you, could, you could say that, okay, if I'm gonna take a three hour exposure with red, green, green, blue, that's three hours in, with that um, configuration of the pixels. But if I take one hour red, one hour green, one hour blue, it's the same amount of time, but each of the subs is the entire spectrum that, of the filter that you're using. So that's the trade off. Yeah. And okay. it, just to, to go one level deeper, right? So when we're processing our one shot color, we're, we're taking one of the greens out essentially, right? We're, we're kind of backing off on those greens when we do the levels or whatever the software that we use. Yeah. Um, so you've collected time on it, and then you subtract it out. So it's, it's a double. I have, a, I have a question. Well, the, re the reason why we have two greens, of course, is because guess what? That's where the human eye has the most sensitivity during right. daylight. And that's what the camera, that's what the sensors were designed for is yeah. daylight photography. Right. So the, the reason there's two greens is that you, first of all, unless you want to have triangular cells, which would be harder for the hardware engineers to read out. So if you have a square pixel cell and you have two in, two, in each corner you have a green and a blue and in the other corners you have a green and a green, a green and a red, um, that matches the sensitivity curve of the human eye much better. So right. from the standpoint of daylight photography. Greg, so, uh, so if you take- hey, if Greg, you Greg had a question. Okay. So does that mean that half of the sensor is uh, on a color sensor, half of it is green? And yeah. Twenty-five percent yeah. red, twenty-five percent is blue. Yeah, that's the so-called Bayer array, B-A-Y-E-R, as in you know the same spelling as Bayer aspirin, except it's called Bayer, of course, because he was a German. Yeah. But um, yeah. Mark Wagner. Yes. So could you on the DSLR go to black and white exposure, and then just put filters in front? So you're turning off the Bayer array and then no. shooting it through the red, green, blue filters. No, the filters are actually in the hardware directly above the pixels. Yeah. 
the sensor's built that way. Yeah. It's got these tiny little hemis these tiny little quasi hemispherical filters that are dyed right on top of it. So no, you can't do that. If you go to monochrome, all it's doing is it's just summing all the data. <laughs> And in fact, you can do that with the CCDs. I mean, I've got a color CCD and it'll run in a monochrome mode, but basically it's got one quarter of the spatial resolution, but it's got more data yeah. per pixel, but the pixels are bigger. I took a raw image off of my DSLR at one point, and I thought I had it set to take a mono image. But when it loaded into Photoshop, it brought it up in color. <laughs> <laughs> So, so sorry, one follow-up question to that then. W would it be, based on what you had suggested about the um, setting, setting the DSLR to mono, would it be the case that you could shoot mono via the mono setting without the filters, albeit no. at a lower resolution than no? no? Oh, okay. oh, yes, yes, you can do that. Okay. Yes, you can do that. You can also shoot, if you just shoot in raw mode, you can always just filter, you know, in post-process the data and suck it all out because raw mode actually captures what the hardware does. It doesn't combine it to make a so-called JPEG. The normal output that most normal human beings, which we aren't, deal with are called JPEGs or TIFFs. And those have the, the blending already done. But if you shoot a raw, you can always post-process it, um, you know, to, to uh, treat all the pixels as mono. But don't forget, they're going to be filtered because there's a hardware filter in front of the sensor. It's built into the pixels. So really, trying to shoot mono with a DSLR, you're kind of fooling yourself. Got it. If you want to shoot mono, the real reason not to shoot mono is because of the time factor in yeah. our environment. I've got a friend who shoots from the Sierra Nevadas remotely. Of course, right now he's not doing anything. Guess why? But you know, when it's clear out there in the, in the Sierra Nevadas, he'll shoot 30, 30 hours spread over a week of one object. Right, right. Wow. I, can't, I can't do that here. First yeah. of all, I'm not inclined to do it. Second of all, um, you know, it, it, it would be impossible in our climate. Yeah, so, so Corey, to, you know, to further follow up on your question, uh, eventually I'm probably going to add mono to my arsenal. Um, but I'm, my expectations are it'll be probably one object over one to two months, just because of what Mark is saying. Because, you know, I don't know, if, I don't know if you guys remember back in January, February, we had zero clear nights. Yeah. So, you know, and I was hoping to get the the Sol Nebula during that time, and you know, and it just went on by. So, <laughs> that's 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 what yeah that's what we have to deal with. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Good. All right, so uh, bands on the run. So we got what kind of filters? We have broadband filters, right? So those kind of filters um, are our general purpose. They're good for your, uh, on galaxies, star clusters, and a, a little bit on nebula. Um, and the purpose of these broadband filters are to remove the man-made light and sky glow, right? So. Um, do I go sit? Yeah, so some of the examples of that are your UHC fil filters, which are ultra high contrast. Um, they're called LPS, which is light pollution suppression. Um, there's an IDAS series. I, I've, I've used the D2. I've used it and sold it um, because it was really hard to process with the DSLR. Uh, CLS is... Um, I forgot what CLS is. Does anybody know? Light, um, I don't remember. City light suppression, I think. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's what it is. So there's a lot of different things you can use. And this applies both to visual and, and, um, and uh, astrophotography as well. <coughs> so, but uh, narrow band is, is really where it gets kind of interesting, right? So, um, the objects uh, really, when you're talking about narrow bands, um, are really nebulae and and certain regions in a, in a galaxy, right? So, like in that picture of M uh, M33, the triangulum I had, um, I actually have data for for H alpha in there, but I haven't added it into the final, and I don't think I'm going to. But you can just shoot, you know, uh, a galaxy and capture bits and pieces of those. Uh, you know, nebulous regions in the galaxy. 
Um, so again, the types that you 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 kind of want to collect are the big three are H alpha, oxygen three, and sulfur, sulfur two. Um, you also have H beta, uh, he, some helium, and, and I forgot what the N is. Neon. Um, neon, and really it doesn't make any impact on what we're trying to collect. No, I'm sorry. N N is nitrogen. I'm sorry. Nitrogen. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. N E is neon. And yeah. and I, I put the H E two with the space apart, so it didn't look like hell. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Um, okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. So some of the narrow band uh, filter examples um, that we have. Um, let's look at some H A. Um, but this is what we would call single pass filters, right? They're just allowing one slice of that spectrum to get through. So uh, you can get a dedicated HA filter, a dedicated O3 filter. I know Bob, uh, Bob Butwell just picked up an O3 filter um, or, or the sulfur. Uh, but for, for me with, uh, and for those of us with one shot color, we like to have you know, single if we can, but if we can get away with multi-band uh, pass through, that's, you know, even better. So you can have, you know, one, one two, three, or four uh, bands in a single filter. Now, the problem is, um, you know, the one is, is, is reasonably cost, two it gets pretty expensive, three and four is just beyond belief so you're talking like up around a grand yeah. for a single filter um, you can do pretty well with the two band filters um, because there's a lot of companies that offer them um, and with various quality and by quality I don't mean necessarily to manufacturing but the the quality in the bandwidth it's it's suppressing and letting through and we'll talk more about that towards the end so uh, should, uh, let me pause. Are there any questions at, at this point? Andy, can I point out that the single pass HAO3S2 is uh, a lot of the Hubble narrowband images are taken with those three filters. Right. So, yeah, you've heard about the Hubble palette, right? So you see all these funky uh you know colors when you when you're talking about looking looking at it so much differently the one shot color that's where that comes from so i have a question yeah go ahead so there's oxygen three filters for visual and for photography yeah i i used uh oxygen three um <clears throat> because i wanted to to visually uh, back in the day when I wanted to look at, you know, nebula and, um, are you, you know, using the same filter for photography? Uh, n well, I, I, I've long since passed those days. So, um, I, I can't, I'm, I can't speak to observing. Well, I, I'm using mine for visual and I did try it with my revolution imager, the oxygen three filter that is, and it did work, but I just was wondering if anybody knew, what the difference between the astrophoto oxygen three filter versus the visual oxygen three filter. Because I thought there was a difference, but I'm not really sure what it was. Maybe I'm wrong. My, so. my guess, my guess, uh, Greg, is that the visual, they're probably a little less concerned with um, narrowing down the band. Oh, so, so the astrophoto might be a narrower? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wasn't thinking about talking about this but it's probably worth mentioning so like you can get h alpha filters in 12 uh nine six and three nanometers right and guess what you know it's narrowing it down and the prices go way the heck up so when you're talking about a ha three nanometer uh filter which i think astronomic is the only company that that makes them it's like 350 400 bucks i want to say and also, the narrower the band, the longer exposure you have to take. There you go. 
Very, I was very much say, true. You, you really have to look at each filter and look at the graph of its band pass, which yeah. Andy will show some examples of right now. Right. You've got to look at those. Don't just read the marketing and <laughs> on what they want to sell you. Look at the band passes and make right. your own choice. Right. It can make a huge difference in price. Okay, so the reality is um, I did do that, but I didn't really understand what I was looking at. So. <laughs> Hopefully we, uh, you know, looking at this next graph will help help a little, right? Yeah. So, by, the way, so, by the way, some of them, like Celestron's Oxygen 3, is sold for both photographic and visual. Whether that's true or not, it's another question. You'd have to look at the band pass to make the decision. So what, what this is, is a generic, uh, well, it's not generic, but I didn't want to name it at this point. Um, this is a uh, multi-band light pollution filter. So an LPS or CLS or one of those guys, right? So what we're seeing here is in these, these greens where my mouse is, you guys can see that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is the hydrogen beta and oxygen three in here. Over here is, um, you know, HA. I'm not sure what this is on this side. And and these spectrums are all the man-made spectrums, all in the orange lines. So what it's doing is letting through everything, but trying to cut out those man-made spectrums, right? And, and this is where Mark's point is, is really good because if you can compare these graphs from the various manufacturers and look at them, you can see, well, this one, some of them won't, you know, they'll just come right over the top here and let this one go through. Right, and so it's you know it's not quite as good, but it's less expensive. So that's the trade-off you gotta you know you gotta deal with. Uh, any questions on this before I move on? Are these all published across the same dimensions by all the manufacturers? So they are uh, you could like layer them over each other and. Uh, well, you could try. <laughs> yeah, they usually all have a graph, at least the ones I've looked at. Yeah, but, but if that by, by the mean if that if by that you mean Corey, are they on a standard scale in terms yeah. of nanometers per millimeter? Oh yeah. no, of course not. Okay, <laughs> why would they be? All right, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, what, what what I have done in the past is I've actually screen snapshotted these things and then rescaled them in PaintShop Pro or Photoshop so that I can put them on a common scale myself. <laughs> of course you did, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it just takes a few mouse clicks. I mean, you know, well, I just did it actually. I was, I was actually just comparing the Orion uh, Sky Glow imaging filter to the L Pro of uh, Optilon. Right, right. And guess what? They're virtually identical. That doesn't, yeah, doesn't surprise me. 50 bucks difference though. Well, there you go. Hopefully the quality is the same. Yeah, well, who, who knows? Who knows? All right, so uh, here's an example of, of from Mark. He sent me a few uh, examples for HA, right? So, you know, you're not seeing any color, but you, this is w what you would represent in, in the red, you know, if, if you wanted to, or else you could do the Hubble palette, right? So this is the elephant trunk, you know, right in here. So it's a really nice region of the sky to shoot. But just to... Um little background on it. This was taken from my backyard in Lombard, which I'm about 15 miles from O'Hare. So heavy light pollution. Neighborhoods got a lot of sodium vapor light. Um, I believe this was an hour long total with five minute subs. So 12 five minute subs. Right. And this, and is, re this is a really bright nebula. Yes. So, you know, you're able to do that. Yeah, I've, I've found, you know, and of course I'm shooting different than Mark shooting mono. Um, with my one shot colors, some objects I think, wow, I really like to get it. And, you know, I'm shooting four or five hours and it's barely coming through, you know, because the signal is so low. The thing about the advantage of black and white under the hydrogen alpha band is that you can have a lot of success in terrible light conditions. And you know, you could see more contrast in black and white than in color. Um, I've tried to shoot this in color around here and it's, it's really tough to do. It is, yeah. Well, you, well you're right near, you're also right near that freeway. I forget which one it is. 355 in North yeah. Avenue, right there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right by 355. I mean, that thing's lit up like a circus. Yeah. That's, worse, that's much worse than O'Hare Field is for you, I would think. Yeah, but you know, this is, uh, 
I want them to have some success. So this is one way to do it is to yeah. shoot narrow band. Yeah. So is it the case that these filters remove all of the color? They prevent color from? Well, again, I'm shooting in mono hydrogen alpha. Okay, yeah, fair enough. And when I process it, I'm processing it as a black and white, no color. Yeah, what you would do if you wanted color is you would shoot this in red, blue, you would shoot it in the red, a reddish filter like hydrogen alpha, you'd shoot it in some, in some, in some band passes that were near blue and green, and then you'd combine them post-processing. So yeah. if you, I don't know if you could see my, uh, my uh, screen from where I'm, you know, the, uh, Participant screen, and if you take a look in the back, that's a red, green, blue, hydrogen alpha of Lagoon Nebula. So that's what Mark was saying. It's, it's, it's a, probably an hour each in red, green, and blue, and half an hour in hydrogen alpha. Roger. So you just have to do the math. <laughs> All right, and here's uh, four more famous ones uh, that Mark gave me. So you have California Nebula, the Pelican, Pickering's Triangle, and the ro Rosette, correct, Mark? Yes, and, and the <laughs> California Nebula is uh, three, a three-panel mosaic because it's pretty big. And I think the same was with the uh, Rosette Nebula. That's also a... a, a, a um, Three panel, so it's like three hours each on each of those. Those are awesome shots, and that that's a function of the chip size and the focal length of the instrument. Yes, the fact that you need to do because with 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 a larger sensor, even with a longer focal length, you can capture those objects in a single frame. Right, right. Yeah. but it's a function. You, Mark, you know, and then I've done that. But what I like to do with the with the um, mosaic thing is that I can get detail without having to like enlarge it and lose the resolution. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, again, it's a trade off. You do the math on stuff. And yeah. How many hours you want to spend and yeah. yeah. When you talk about those larger, larger sensors, are those still DSLR cameras or are these? No, this is a, this is a uh, S big CCD imager. This is not, this is not with a uh, DSLR. Astronomy. It's an astronomy imager. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. It's a monochrome sensor. There is no filter on the chip. Roger. All the pixels. I mean, if you took your, if you took your, if you could take your DSLR and take a, and take a milling machine and mill off the top part of the sensor, you'd be making a monochrome sensor. Right. And that's, I mean, that's one, a monochrome sensor, it's the same underlying chemistry. Well, if CCDs is different chemistry than, than CMOS. Uh, sensors like in your camera, but basically it's the same thing except that on a in a digital SLR or a single shot color There are little tiny filters fused right on top of the pixels Whereas with a mono sensor they don't and then of course they mysteriously enough they charge more for it Because and they, <laughs> that's what, I think it's because the market's smaller. Yeah, sure And I check that Oh, here we all right, so Crab Nebula. Um, Mark, you want to talk about the combining of, of the channels? Sure. So this one I shot in the, in the hydrogen alpha, oxygen, and sulfur. And uh, I think this is through, I forget which telescope, but again, it's with the, with the SPIG. And um, under hydrogen alpha, you see, you could see in, in black and white of that, the, all these little tendrils and stuff in there. And the O3 and S2 we add the different colors on there. So that's the the uh, Crab Nebula. I, it's probably an hour on each channel of that with uh, either the six inch or the 12 inch scope. I can't remember. Um, but that's what's possible with the narrow band to get the color. <clears throat> yeah, I, and uh, and Mark, did uh, do you did you shoot with a luminance too, or did I, I just add that on my own? No, the red, green, blue luminance is not on this one, just the, the three narrow. Oh, bands. okay, okay. My, my mistake. All right. Interesting. So, um, you know, so with my camera, it's uh, a one shot color, right? Um, and it's an astro dedicated astronomy camera. Um, so, what I'm about to show you is um, a light pollution uh, suppression filter. 27 stubs at 240 seconds, so it's 160 minutes. And so that's the double cluster. 
Yeah. You know, and it's it's really gorgeous. I I just I'm going to shoot this every year because I just it's like my second favorite visual object. Um. So with the you know with the the filter that I use, it gives pretty good star color too. So. But what's what's interesting is that you know, of course, when you're shooting and stacking, it doesn't look like this out out of the box, right? It looks like this, right? So here, you know, it looks green. Why is that? Green, red, green, green, green. blue, <laughs> right? So you know, it takes you. You got to do a little work to make it come out correctly you got to remove the you know the green cast or the you know depending on the filter the the filter i used to have with my dslr you give a blue cast you know and um so you have to deal with all that but the you know as you learn to process things whether you know whether it's you know you can do everything now with free software uh, we, that would be an interesting subject for another another meeting but um yeah i just wanted to make sure you, you, nobody thought that these pictures are just popping out of the camera like this, you know. So, uh, Jim, uh, you joined late, and I, I took the liberty of putting your picture up. <laughs> um, so, Jim took this one of uh, he has a modded DSLR. So, what what is a modded DSLR? It's removing of some of that malarkey that's in front of the the sensor that gives the red, green, green, blue. Right and no, okay. No, good. no, 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 no. All right, explain it, Mark. Because what, what the modded sense in regular DSLRs have what is called an IR cut filter in front of the sensor. So okay. you've got the sensor, you've got the individual pixels, then you've got these little micro filters for red, green, blue, and then there's a cover glass on top of it, and that cover glass in a standard SLR cuts off the infrared. And it does that That's because right. the sensors are actually very sensitive to infrared radiation. So they have to cut off that IR or all your images that you would take of your cats and dogs and flowers would be blurry because they wouldn't be in focus. So they have that IR cut filter. The problem is, is that with many SLRs, that cut filter cuts off too soon. So it cuts off all this beautiful red stuff. So therefore, some people buy DSLRs and they pay to have that filter removed. That filter in front of the, in front yeah. of the sensor. So the, you've still got the red, blue, green filters built into the camera, but you've removed that IR cut filter. Right, and yeah, maybe replaced it with some glass or something, right? There's yeah, a whole yeah, bunch of different options. Yeah, well, and in fact, you could buy a camera made that way, and of course, they charge you more for that than they charge <laughs> you for one with the filter, which is or, just, you know. Yeah, or you could do what Jim and I did and just go to Cloudy Nights and buy somebody's used. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, but, well, I'll be honest with you, because people are getting rid of them because it's, it's no longer that, it's no longer necessary because the newer SLRs, of course, they're expensive. Yeah. The newer SLRs have better filters in front of them. So yeah, well, okay, right. But I, I picked up mine for 350 bucks versus the newer ones are two grand, right? Yeah, so. right, right, right. And, all, and also the people who paid, you know, but, but getting one of those modded, if you, you're smart, you and Jim were smart to buy them used because it'll cost you 400 bucks to get the mod done. Right. You know, you might as, well just go buy, might as well just go buy a new camera if you had to pay that. Yeah, and and Mark Pastor is really smart too because he bought mine used. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, if someone if someone were to buy one now and pay to get it modded, I think they'd be crazy. All but right, picking one up used is a smart thing to do. Yeah. So, um, but the reason I wanted to show show this one is because it's a, a modified DSLR. But two, you know, two, you know, Jim here used a. Uh, duo duo band filter. So from SDC, I don't know who's that manufacturer, Jim. I don't really know the name okay. of it. Okay. All right, but it, I mean, this is a, a a lovely wide field shot with this tree in it. Of course, it's hard to process around the tree, but um, I mean, you've got you got the soul nebula, the heart nebula, and up here is you were earlier this night tonight it was the fish head. That's it right there, okay. and then the double clusters down here. So it's that's really a lovely shot. How big was the aperture on on this uh, telescope? 
probably yeah, the camera lens, was it? It was a 135 millimeter lens. It was the Sam Yang F2. That's a good lens. Yeah, I love it. So yeah, so Jim's setup isn't even with a with a a telescope mount. It's with a, uh, a what they call a star tracker, right? Right. So um, a star tracker with a with a you know regular camera lens. So. I mean, there's all sorts of ways to approach astrophotography, and I love wide field myself. And uh, those were only 30 second exposures. So I always thought I had to do like five minute exposures to get any kind of image. And this is not a great image, admittedly, but it's, I got something with a 30 second exposure. How many of them were there total, Jim? I can't remember on this image. There weren't no more than 20. Yeah, well, that's plenty. Yeah. Yeah, cool. It helps to have a fast lens. I mean, the F2 makes yes. a big difference. All right. So, uh, you know, uh, here's one one of mine with a dual, uh, dual band filter. It's 160 minutes. This is the uh, Cocoon Nebula. Um, now, you know, what I love to try and get is the Dark Nebula. Yeah. But I, it's really hard to do with the one shot color. It's just you know, the mono would do much better on getting it. But it's still, I'm, you know, more than happy with it. So, yeah, we talked about that. Um, so, filter manufacturers, you got Astronomic, Astrogena, Bayer, Utech, Optolong. I'm sure there's a lot more STC, whatever that one was. Um, and then there's some of the lower end ones, which are a lot cheaper. I can't speak to the quality of them. Maybe they're really good, but um, I'll let you know on my O3. That's an SP Boney. Oh, I had good. It for forty bucks. Yeah, great. Love to hear about it. I guarantee you, it is not ultra narrow band. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. By the By the way, some of these filters, like Optilongs, they're all on back order. <clears throat> can't buy them right now. No, I know, you know, yeah. Not available until October. Yeah, you know, you know who, who has them is Starizona. That's the only outfit that has them. Really? Yeah, at least they did. Um, so just to give you the background of where I've gone over time, uh, I went through uh, astronomic CLS filter with a DSLR. I went through, um, uh, Ba right. Who does the IDAS? Was it's it's Utah? No, Bader. 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 So uh, I use the you know the D two series after doing you know research and reading and um, and that was I, I felt that was too aggressive too and I had a hard time processing it. Um, maybe if I was in Bortle five or Bortle four skies, it wouldn't be as much of an issue, but. Um, and then eventually I ended up uh, after researching it uh, with Optolong and I'm really, really happy with it. So here is the uh, L-Pro um, spectrum that, that it allows through. Um, you can see it's, you know, it's quite wide around the, you know, the uh, H-beta and O3. Um, and I imagine this is sulfur over here and then H-alpha over here. So um, the L Pro runs about 200 bucks. You know, it's a little more expensive. And if Mark is correct, and the what? Which one were you talking about? Celestrons? It, no, no, it's the uh, Orion's, um, which they which they've been selling for a long time. I bought mine, I think, in 2006. Uh, it's the it's the um, Orion Sky Glow Imaging Filter. It's almost identical. Yeah, so that'd be a it'd be a curious a curious one-to-one uh, -one test. I'd I'd like to see the difference. Now the band passes look almost the same. Yeah, the red's a little bit. The far red felt band pass is a little different. Everything else when you okay. when you when you when you match up the peaks because like Corey asked, there's no standard thing for plotting these. Yeah. So I I took the 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 peak there at the far left and the the dub the small double peak there towards the right and lined them up on top of each other and everything matched very closely except for the leaning for the trailing edge excuse me near 700 nanometers otherwise they looked identical okay 
which doesn't surprise me. There's no magic in this stuff. It's just a matter of how many, how many layers of coating you want to sputter onto the filter, you know, how much money you want to spend. Yep. Yep. Uh, we're lucky to be able to. I, can you rely on the manufacturer's published graph to be accurate? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? There's no oh. FDA in this business. Right. Yeah. yeah. Everybody operates with integrity, right? Yeah. Well, no, no, it's just, it's not a matter of integrity. It's just a matter of process control. And there's no, you know, this is not, yeah, yeah. Is not like the FDA or the D DOD. I mean, you know, this is a small, this is a small dinky market, which is part of why the stuff's so expensive. Yeah. And besides it's, it's for astronomy. So there's a perception it's gotta be expensive. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's move along. Um, so here, you know, I stole this from, um, Trevor Jones from Astro Backyard. He's got a, a, a nice review on the L Pro filter. So he's got, you know, here's what you're getting with the, uh, with two shots, one without the filter, one with um, lots and lots of, of sky glow. You know, I think he's in portal seven, just like I am. Um, but perhaps a better picture is, is this one. So here's, you know, why this is just, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a, 50 millimeter lens, but the difference there is stark, you know, um, as far as the stars beginning to pop out and the light pollution suppressed. But if, if you want to read that article, you could just go to a site and read about it. So a couple of examples, um, you know, here's, here's what I found with the, the two filters that I'm using. Um, I can image um, all, all month long, as long as I, I staying, you know, a good 20 degrees, 20, 30 degrees away from the full moon. But so Markarian's chain, um, this was just five days away from the uh, full moon. Uh, this was one of the first pictures I took with the, with the 533. Mark's got some really excellent wider fields of Markarian's chain. Um, and this, this one was uh, one, on the same day as the full moon. So this is the whale and the crowbar. Again, this was pretty, this is like my second or third photo. So the fact that I can use a generic light pollution filter, you know, around, around the full moon, it makes me ecstatic, right? So um, as long as I'm not shooting near, the, near that full moon. Uh, so the last last uh, thing I have is is comparing the two um, the two Optolong filters, L Enhance and L Extreme. Now the L Enhance is the one you probably can't even get anymore unless you buy it used from somebody because I think they're probably going to stop stop uh, manufacturing it in favor of the L Extreme. Um, I probably I wish I had I had I had had the graphs of both, but the L Extreme is much much tighter around the the O3 and the the hydrogen alpha, and as you can see, oh I did this wrong. Hold on. Um, My God, it's us. Um, are we still? No, I'm not sharing, huh? Let me just share it this way. Um, so here's the Optolong L Enhance is around 200 bucks. The Elk Stream is around 300 bucks. Um, so I did what I did for around uh, the Western Western Vale, I think it is, or the Eastern Vale. I just did 24 minute capture and I did the exact same processing in Deep Sky Stacker in Photoshop. And um, it's pretty clear, hopefully this still works. Oh. Hang on. <laughs> All right. Is so this a review? No, this is my review. This is I wanted yeah. to see no, the. No, no, I'm just talking about going back. From oh, the okay, got it, got it. Yeah, but you can see, you know, look, looking around the region here. I think this is the Eastern Vale, and compare it to here. You know, they both do a good job, but the the region around, you know, the L Extreme is obviously better at, at oh, filtering yeah. out, you know, more of the, the light pollution and sky glow. So uh, I was going to sell my L Enhance, but I think as I, as I um, think about adding a second rig, whether, you know, probably a Star Tracker again, 
of some kind, I'm going to keep the L enhance and use that. But uh, for now on, when I'm shooting Nebula, I'm going to be using the L extreme. So I think that's it. That was a long one. I didn't intend to go that long. Sorry. But it was quality. Well, what we size you filter do you use? Uh, what is it? What was the question? What size filter do you use? Uh, I'm using uh, two-inch filters. I have a filter drawer, so I can pop the filters in and out. Are those uh, standard IPs filters? Um, M48 thread, yes. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Okay, however, thanks. However, you have to read the fine print. Some of the Optolong filters, while the female, while the male thread that fill, that screws into your nose piece or your corrector is the M48 thread, they do their the thread on the on the female side is not. So you can't stack them with something else. You can't put anything else on top of them. You can put things under them, but you can't put anything on top of them. But frankly, who would want to? But it's all the it's all the standard. I the male thread, the part that you care about, that threads into what your eyepiece or into your camera. That's the M48. I think it's 0.7 millimeter pitch. Well, on mine, it it goes uh, between the eyepiece barrel and the eyepiece itself, so they would have to be matching. Huh? And 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 I agree with what you say. These filters are subtractive, so. Uh, you wouldn't stack two or three filters together yeah. simply because of that. But the thread on my filters uh, fit inside the eyepiece, not on the eye, eye part. Huh? I mean, they fit between the barrel and the housing? Yes. Why would you want to do that? Because that's how they sell them. Okay, the ones, all the ones I've seen screw into, all the eyepiece filters I've ever seen screw into the bottom of the eyepiece, into the bottom of the barrel. That's what I mean. It goes between the... You're saying the same thing. We're saying the same thing. Well, what, what's it between? If it, just, if it just screws into the barrel, it's just free space on one side, the barrel on the other. Oh, Whoa. my barrels are removable. So I remove the barrel, put the filter on the, in place of the eyepiece, then I thread the filter into the eyepiece. Uh, Andy, could you wait, can you see me? Uh... Yeah. Okay. So there's the eyepiece barrel, and there's the tubing. So where does your filter go? There or there? Between the barrel and the tubing. Oh my gosh! I've never seen one like that. That means it's got to be specific to the fil to the eyepiece. There's no standard. This thread here between the between the the housing and the barrel, however you want to call these.